Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're quite yes, sir. yes it started, Santander. Good morning, one and all from India. Uh, sorry for the six minute delay due to technical issue. So it is a blessed Sunday. Today, it's the 26th September 2021, is the 18th Foundation Day of CSIR, that is Council of Scientific Intelligence. It was established in the year 1942. CSIR is an autonomous body under Ministry of Science and Technology under Government of India. Any IST, that is Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, is one among 38 laboratories of CSIR. On this auspicious day, I wish each and everyone a very happy CSR Foundation Day. Now, coming back to IPWGST 2021, I'm sure everyone of you, like me, are thoroughly immersed in this once in a long time opportunity to listen and interact with the finest minds of the geosciences world. Let's brace for one more of it by none other than the session chairman of IPWGST 2021, Professor J.R. Kyle. Sure. My sentence would have proceeded with a thundering round of applause if it were happening physically. We honor this session. I kindly invite Professor Zhao to say a few words, please. Over to Professor Zhao. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, well, we all know Professor Jair Kaya is a very famous uh, seismologist and not only in India, but also in the world. But uh, now let me say a few words about uh, our friendship and research collaboration. And uh, I have known Dr. Kaya for 28 years. And uh, I think we first conducted in the uh, early 1993. Actually, my first uh, tomography paper was published in JGR is a uh, uh, 1992 December issue. I think Dr. Kayar saw uh, that paper and he uh, uh, sent me a uh, letter through uh, airmail. But he first sent a letter to uh, Sendai, Japan. But at the time, I was in uh, Caltech, America. So my colleagues in uh, here in Japan followed the, uh, his letter to me to Caltech. So I said that took uh, well, two months, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in the letter uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Kayar in uh, early 1993, he uh, said he is very much interested in the tomography result, and he proposed to do a, a research collaboration for the tomography of Northeast India. And uh, I was very happy about that. And I soon uh, replied and uh, sent him a, a letter about this. But at the time, the email was uh, very uh, limited and hard to use. And uh, no figures can be sent and no text file could be sent. So in the email, we can only say some, something, OK? So uh, Dr. Kair sent me uh, the data, the uh, arrival time data uh, in the Northeast uh, India region by floppy disk. Do you remember, Dr. Kair? You sent me the data through the floppy floppy disk via uh, airmail. And uh, so uh, I read uh, the data from the uh, floppy disk and into my computer at the Caltech. So I, uh, I applied my method to analyze uh, the data from uh, Dr. Kaya. So I got the uh, tomography results and I printed the uh, results in the, color, in the color figures. Then I send the, <laughs> the color figures by airmail to uh, Dr. Kayar. And then he uh, used the uh, figures, the results, and wrote the first uh, manuscript script of the paper. <clears throat> and I just checked our paper in the published in 1998 in BSSA. I found that he uh, submitted the paper to uh, BSSA in uh, uh, January. On uh, January 6th, <laughs> then the paper was was finally published in uh, 19, 
98 June issue of uh, uh, BSSA, that's a pretty team of the uh, Seismological Society of America. And it's a, a very nice uh, paper. But Dr. Kaya wrote, uh, wrote the whole, whole, whole paper. And of course, we had some complication for discussion and the interpretation of the results. And uh, that's the beginning of our uh, research collaboration. Then after that, uh, Dr. Kair introduced uh, uh, several uh, India uh, seismological research to me, uh, such as uh, uh, Dr. O.P. Mishra, he just gave a talk two days ago, and also D.D. Singh and Sagarika and uh, Sandeep Gupta and a few <laughs> other uh, researchers. So that's uh, uh, the start of our research collaboration and also my research collaboration with the India uh, seismological uh, researchers. And uh, so I really appreciate the friendship and the research collaboration with Dr. Thank you so much. And uh, okay. Thank you, Professor Azam, for sharing your experience. Now, introduction of our speaker. Does it any person? Let me know if this one or another specific person got as a link. I uh, I cannot hear you clearly. Is that okay? Yes, that's some uh, some noises there. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here is a concept data of Professor Zierkail. Professor Zierkail did his MSc at Indian School of Mines, Dhanbad, in 1969, and PhD in microarchitecture seismology from Victoria University. New Zealand in 1983. After post graduation, he joined the Oil and Natural Gas Commission when he joined the GEO in 1971. He rose to the rank of Deputy General Manager in the GSI and retired in November 2006. Since 2007, he is an emeritus scientist at the Zadapur University, Kolkata. He is a visiting professor various universities in India and abroad since 1993. He's leading several international research projects for the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. He's a guest faculty to the UNESCO and ICTP and National Coordinator Fellow and member of several national and international scientific unions. CU, AG, AGU, ISPI, IUGG, etc. He has about 44 years of research experience in exploration geophysics and earthquake seismology, and about 20 years of teaching experience in India and abroad. He is author of more than 130 research papers in national and international journals, editor and reviewer of several international and national journals in art sciences. He is author of the book on micro earthquake seismology and seismotechnics of South Asia, published in 2008. I had a tough time in concising the elaborate bio of Professor Kyle. And trust me, I had to skip many notable awards and achievements. Anyway, let's now invite him to the digital dais. Sir, please end it now. Over to Professor Kyle. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Santino. Am I audible? Yes, yes. sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Santanu, for your kind introduction and thanks to my dear friend, Professor Jao, for, for sharing his, or rather our fond memories. Yes, I just want to tell one more thing here, that Professor Jao not only, you know, when the BSSA wanted charges the money for color pictures production, color figures production, Production. Then Professor Zhao told, Don't worry, I'll support it. Then another experience when I when my book was first published, I shared my you know experience and I wrote to him about that book to Professor Zhao. 
and he said, I have already purchased two copies or four copies, something like that. I think four copies, two copies for my center library and two copies for my own life, own laboratory. So that is the generosity and support I always received since 1990s till today. Professor Zhao is, is not only my friend, he is friend of he is friend across the globe. I think he is the most generous and supporting sociologist of the world. Now, without wasting any time, let me come to the topic. Now, our topic today is, and today I am really feeling so, so glad that it is on, on the, it happened to be on the foundation day of CSIR. So I am feeling very good. Though there are some little initial problem in opening my computer, but hope everything is fine now. So let us proceed to the topic today. Recent large, recent large and failed earthquakes in Northeast India, the thermotectonics and precursor appraisal. Yes, hope now you can see. So this is my starting you know, uh, point always. I want to show you how the Indian plate reached to this present situation since last 71 million years. And today this is the you know, topography map of the whole Southeast Asia. You can see the Himalayan Kalisan zone. You can see the Andaman Sumatra subduction or trench. An Indian plate is moving from the Karlsberg region somewhere here towards north northeast and on head on collision in the Himalaya. And the Indian Oceanic plate, Indian Ocean plate, it is subducting below Andaman Sumatra subduction trench, subduction zone, which is also connected with the Indo Burma subduction zone, which was earlier uh, a subduction zone with a trench, but now it is an a typical subduction zone because now it is a continent continent situation, but still the dipping slab is still there that you see in this slide itself. How we are now having the recent sensitive map. Which is clearly showing the Himalayan region, the intense sensitivity and the Indabarma range intense sensitivity, which is connected with the Andaman Sumatra subduction zone. So this is a typical subduction zone, but the indo Burma ranges subduction is, is atypical. And if we see the, you know, the sections across indo Burma, the earthquakes are dipping down to 180 kilometers or so. And across Sumatra, it is down to 300 this is the other Andaman, sorry. This is uh, above one is the Indo Burma range. This one is the Andaman trench. This one at the Sumatra trench. This one at the Java trench. Though the Java trench subduction zone is much complicated to the further east, but it is here, is showing a uh, section somewhere here, is showing a dipping subduction zone down to 660 kilometer. So this is the regional tectonic scenario of the Indian plate. Now this is one of our, you know, uh, I think earlier work I want to show you here that uh, with the ISC data, we tried to understand when I started, you know, the came back to India and started the work. We tried to understand the subduction tectonics in, in this region and using the ISC data up to 1990, we found that this region is intensely active. Then the Himalayan Kalisan zone, then the syntaxis zone, the joining point of the Himalayan arc and the Indo Burma arc. Then the intra plate region, Silang Plateau and Assam Valley, then Bengal Basin, another intra plate zone. So there are different tectonic blocks. And we try to see the subduction structure, you know. Along Himalayan zone, you can see the earthquakes are not dipping. They are almost you know, confined to a depth of 60 to 70 kilometer, but they are deeper than the Western Himalayan earthquakes. That I will come later. Then across Silang Plateau and Indo Burma ranges, you can see a clear, clear Beniop zone, 
this interface we demarcated from the from fast faulting to normal faulting region and this is the envelope so a, a clear venue of zone is visible here across Sri Lanka to Nindabarma, then Bengal Basin and Nindabarma ranges. Also, we can see a clear venue of zone, though Bengal Basin is you know, very less active compared to Sri Lanka interpret zone. And then we, and another observation we made that along the Nindabarma ranges, when we examined the section of the earthquakes, we found that the earthquakes are down to 150 or 180 kilometer, but Above 26 degree latitude, the earthquakes are shallow. Means it seems that the subduction ceases beyond 26 degree latitude and the collision tectonics takes over. So that is our observation in, in earlier paper. And then also we tried to examine this structure, this venue of zone structure with the gravity map. And this was the gravity map published by Marma and Mukhopadhyay. That gravity observations we also you know made the modeling and theoretical and computed values were matching well and so this structure is used here to see the gravity anomaly in this region so geophysical uh, data and the seismological data were fairly well studied uh, in our this work then of late very recently we have taken now we prefer to take EHB catalog data in ISC EHB catalog data because that is uh, more precisely located. Uh, so far the teleseismic or regional earthquake data is concerned. So we took this data and examined this earthquakes. Again, we took the sections which is fairly same as that our earlier observations of the ISC data. And this is the across Silang Patu and in the warmer ranges. This is across Bengal Basin and in the Burma Ranges. So they are fairly, you know, uh, in agreement. And uh, this structure, and we will, we will be discussing about these recent earthquakes over here. And we also examine plotted those recent earthquakes in this structure, and they are all marked with the red circular seven magnitude, and the star two great earthquakes are shown by star, uh, you know, mark. So this is the uh, recent observation. Now another good work was uh, was published by uh, Rao and Kalpona. It came in GRL. It was very fascinating that they observed that the mostly you know normal faulting and strike slip faulting at the shallower depth of the subducting Indian plate, and at the deeper depth they are mostly thrust faulting. And they could demarcate that below 90 degree, the earthquakes are of thrust faulting mechanism, and shallower means, you know, shallow depth to 90 kilometer depth. These earthquakes are mostly normal faulting and strike slip faulting, and they uh, they gave a clear demarcation, and that was a good observation uh, in their work. Now, this is one of our recent studies of regional seismic tomography in NER. This work was, you know, uh, taking teleseismic data. Kaulakov made this observation, made this map, and where he has shown that the section along this line, he has shown a, a dipping structure, the Indovarma, you know, the high velocity structure, subducting slab which is going down to more than 400 kilometer. And it is broken uh, somewhere here and the still, still the seismicity is observed at the upper part of the subduction structure, high velocity zone up to 200 kilometer. And below the this part is possibly broken, but the high velocity structure is still existing there. So this is a very good observation. Then on a DST RFBR project, we took the regional data here from our local network and from regional network here, and we made another effort to study this. We studied this 100 kilometer, you know, 
up to hundred our study confined up to hundred kilometer. And Carlo Cook gave a you know global uh, you can say take, take, take the global earthquakes and gave this picture. So when we did the detailed structure of this uh, you know upper part up to hundred kilometer, we found that our results are compatible with earlier results, and we gave more uh, detailed structure of this uh, of the lithosphere uh, over here. So that was our latest uh, tomography results in Northeast India. So now let us come to the Northeast India uh, recent uh, large earthquakes. We can safely you know, say that there is a Himalayan collision zone and the earthquakes are, as you know, all know, Assam 1950, magnitude 8.4. These are all uh, MW and uh, old earthquakes are all revised by Ambassage and Douglas. So I am only taking the MW values because it was given M M7, uh, 8.7 MS uh, magnitude, but it is revised is 8.4. Then the Bhutan earthquake, recent earthquake, there is no doubt about the MW here. They're all recent broadband records. The Sikkim, 6.9. Then the IBR subduction zone earthquakes. I'm taking there are something like 20 large earthquakes, but I'm just mentioning the since 90s, say 1998, 1988, then 2015, then 2016, and the recent Mizoram 2020. Of course, it's a swarm type of activity. I will discuss this one. These red marks are, you know which we will discuss more in more detail, our recent earthquakes in this part of the country. Then the intraplate earthquakes, are among them are the 1869, that is this red circle, and the 1943, this red circle. These are the two large earthquakes in the valley area, you can say, or along the Kofili Fault. And then Assam, Earthquake most recently it is somewhere here. I will I will come into that in more detail. Then the Manipur earthquake 2016, it is here. This black star. The, all these black stars are recent earthquakes since after 1950. So this is Manipur earthquake 2016. Then the Silong plateau earthquakes. These are, these are plateau earthquakes. So different tectonic blocks I am giving you. Silong 1897. It was MS 8.6 or 8.7, but the revised magnitude MW 8.1. And Dubri earthquake 1930, 7.1, it is somewhere here. And this Silong earthquake is somewhere here. This, this big star. And they have also given, I will discuss about this. Then the Bengal Basin earthquakes, that is this red circle, Simongol earthquake, which is a 1918 earthquake. And then my Singh earthquake 1923, this one, this at the junction of the hinge zone and the Dauki fault. Then comes the Tipura fold belt earthquake. They are not great or large earthquake, but they have oil felt. One is 1950, that is here. It's part of Bengal Basin, you can say. And this is 2017, 5.7. So we will discuss this recent event also, this red mark. I have also marked it as red. So this few earthquakes, recent earthquakes, will will try to understand their uh, tectonics. Now a quick uh, review of the Eastern Himalayan earthquakes. So these are Nepal earthquakes, Bihar Nepal earthquake 1934, Bihar Nepal earthquake 1988, Sikkim earthquake 6.9 2011. Bhutan earthquake 2009 and the Assam Tibet earthquake 1950. These earthquakes, let us have a quick uh, review and then we will go to our uh, most recent earthquakes. The quick review shows that this Nepal 2 earthquake 2015 earthquake, a typical thrust mechanism. You can see the, the very low angle, this not dipping plane is is perfectly matching with the Himalayan MHT, the plane of detachment. So there is no doubt about their location, their fault plane solution. Everything is fine. So they are MHT earthquake and thrust faulting earthquakes, low angle thrust faulting earthquakes. 
But when it comes to this 1934 Bihar Nepal earthquake, Bihar Nepal border earthquake at the on the MBT or south of MBT, which is not very typically, you know, thrust faulting earthquake. This is all CMD solutions. Rather, you can see, you know, this is not there is no, you know, low angle not dipping plane. So if you take this plane, this is quite high angle and and there is strike slip component. Similarly, the 1988 earthquake, which is deep, much deeper earthquake, and also shows a strike slip fault. These two earthquakes are, these earthquakes has no controversy because this is well recorded, well located, well uh, understood by its fault and solution. But 1934, there is some, you know, controversy, though people, uh, you know, accept it as thrust faulting and MST earthquake, but I have different opinion about this earthquake. Now comes Sikkim earthquake, 2011 Sikkim earthquake. This is typical strike slip fault, and this is a much deep earthquake at a depth of 50 kilometers. So there is no match of the earthquakes in the eastern or northeastern Himalaya with the so with the so-called MST or planar detachment typical. Thrust faulting earthquakes. Even I suppose it has started from the 1934 and further to the east. The Sikkim earthquake is like this. Then come 2009 Bhutan earthquake. This is also strike slip. We have we have done our own solution, and uh, although uh, thrust faulting solution has been shown uh, by the global data, but we took the regional data and we made a effort uh, in the Russian project. And we found out to be a strike slip, and we interpreted it to be a on the northern extension of the Kofili fault at this, you know, curvilinear structure of the MCT. This earthquake occurred, and this is this occurred by strike slip, not a typical, typical thrust faulting earthquakes uh, on the MHT. Now, this is of course I will discuss later. This is a 1897 great earthquake, and. So let us try to understand the Eastern Himalaya earthquakes first. Then this is the 1950 earthquake. Now two solutions were given, one by fast motion plot by Chen and Muller in 19, sometimes in 19, 1990 or so. And then in his solution, in, in his original paper in 1990 paper, you'll find that he has given, uh, plotted the fast motion and he has given two solutions. By two by by two pair of nodal planes. That it can be fast faulting. It can be also strike slip faulting because fast motion data has always got that. If if you if your data is not well distributed as as uh, it can be controversial. So he also mentioned clearly that it could be a thrust faulting. It could be a strike slip faulting as well because the nodal planes also can fit. And uh, then when um, he has given a CMD solution which is strike slip. Halt and uh, myself also prefer this strike slip solution of the 1950 earthquake. It is not a typical MHT earthquake because here a lot of earthquake solutions are found by Halt in this region and they are shallow earthquakes are all, they are shallow, not shallow, they are 40 to 50 kilometer depth, they are all strike slip mechanism. So this is complicated zone, you know, not typical Himalayan MHT earthquakes. And here the Indubama are, and the Sagain fault is just, you know, joining here. And there, there are a structure like this. So these the structure, these thrust faultings or these faults are fairly, you know, compatible with this nodal plane. So this, this is about the Eastern Himalaya earthquakes. Now, as I was telling, if we feed this, this is this is a very good work by Mansalbe, his PhD thesis in JGR, it was published. And there he opened our eyes that earthquakes are not only confined on the MHT. I think he was the first man. Then I took up this this uh, topic, and I I think I also tried to understand this deeper earthquakes. So he has shown this is a, from a French Nepal telemetric very good network data, digital network data. It was published in 2006. And he has shown that there is not only planar detachment earthquake cluster of earthquakes, but there are deeper source zone also, also to the south, south of MET or south of, you know, uh, at the MFT MET zone. So 
about 2015 earthquake, there is no doubt about that they are the plane of detachment earthquake and by thrust faulting and everything is fine. They obey uh, in the MST in the tectonic model. But I have a doubt about 1934 because this is controversial. I uh, means different depths are given by different authors. It, Richter has given 40 and Ewe has given something like 35. So this is not really typically plane of detachment, you know, some 15, 20 kilometer depth. Here it is 20 kilometer, but here it is about 15, 20 kilometers. So they are maybe 25. So this depth wise and fault plane solution wise, these you know, deeper source zone could be the source zone for the 1934 earthquake. Then another, this is well studied, well estimated depth by Japanese network by many agencies, and they have shown this 50 kilometer depth and which is strike slip. So I presume that 1934, 1988 could be from the deeper source zone. This is, you know, a controversy again. But uh, the ne Nepal geoscientists and uh, other groups, they believe that 1934 is on the plane of the MHT earthquake. So now for the Sikkim earthquake, there is a fair, it is very, fairly well studied. Now you can see here, the Sikkim earthquake is red star in the Sikkim Himalaya in the, in the further east. So you can see the red star and it is, it is very well, well located and well studied by fault plane solution, the CMD solution, and the previous earthquake also from something like 5.8 also shows price step solution. And when we examine the section across with the, with the EHB data, we found that there is a you know particle structure, and this red star is the main shock of 2011 Sikkim earthquake, and these red stars are the after shocks. And these black stars are all imagine 5.5 or oil studied earthquakes, and these are the those earthquakes. So a, a typical and these small dots are all magnitude less than five. So this particle structure is well, you know, well uh, reflected uh, in our observation. And this is the, the so-called planar detachment. So I doubt whether the planar detachment at all is existing in the eastern or northeastern Himalayas. Because there are so many transverse structure, and this is a, this earthquake we have we have interpreted in in terms of the Kista lineament or Kista fault. This is lineament is given by GSI at last, but we now define it to be a Kista fault. This is a fault, and that generated this 2011 earthquake, and there are several earthquakes here, and they are by strike state fault. And fortunately, there was a micro earthquake network, telemetric network by uh, or standalone, I forget, by NGRI. Uh, almost semi permanent. They, they have run it for a couple of years, maybe for a decade. And that network was there when the 2011 earthquake occurred. And that's PhD student, uh, Pinky Hajarika, and his guide, Ravi Kumar. They have come out with a vertical structure with the, with the aftershocks of the uh, 2011 earthquake. So a vertical structure and strike slip faulting in the Silong area, I mean Sikkim area in the Eastern Himalaya, I think, I think leaves no doubt. And uh, they, they didn't do any tomography work, but uh, a empty work was published in 2009 by Patra and Rinaran. And they showed, and, and it was fortunately along, you know, the epicenter zone across, rather across the epicenter zone that profile was from foothills to Himalaya. And they have shown uh, at the source zone uh, in, in the in the Sikkim Himalaya uh, the the heterogeneous structure of uh, conductive zone and high uh, and high resistive zone. And at this juncture, at this heterogeneous structure, I think a tomography could have given such you know such structure, uh, you know. And uh, this heterogeneous structure is a very favorable for stress accumulation. And uh, this was the zone of you know Sikkim. Earthquake, source zone of Sikkim earthquake. Then Santana Bodu and others, I think I was also co author. We have uh, given this uh, you know, Coulomb stress transfer uh, picture and which shows that how the, how the aftershocks are, are uh, along this you know, uh, high stress zone. So this is our Sikkim earthquake. 
And then we come to Then we come to interpret uh, a quick review of the interpret earthquake. I think this is uh, this uh, does not need more explanation already. Uh, Dr. Mishra has explained it and Dr. Borua also explained all these things. I just want to say that this is this is 1897 earthquake and this is far away from the you know from the uh, boundary uh, thrust zone or the uh, subduction zone and this is an interpret Sri Lanka to earthquake and uh, in his report Oldham uh, presume that this could be a thrust faulting and by not dripping thrust faulting and there is a Dauki fault here which is separating the Sri Lanka to this you know part of Indian silt and this is again fragmented into Miki plateau and Sri Lanka plateau by a Kopili fault. The Kopili fault is you know a transverse structure uh, like uh, Tista lineament. This is another transverse structure which is reaching to the Himalaya ac across the Himalaya and and uh, we'll discuss it. So now the this fault mechanism is well studied by uh, by Bilham and England, and they have said that they have proposed a pop up pop up tectonics. Of course, the Sri Lanka is rising from GPS data, and they uh, they propose a pop up tectonic model and propose the Oldham fault and the Dauki fault at the boundary of the Sri Lanka to pop up tectonic te tectonics mechanism. And there is another fault called Dapshi thrust, which is separating the you know the Silang shield or the other granitic rocks from the tertiary sediment. This is the upshift thrust on one offshoot of the Dauki pole. And this, this is the Dauki pole, east to west trending Dauki pole. This is separating the Silang plateau and the Bengal basin. So in his model, he said Dauki fault and the old dump fault, his proposed old dump fault between this Silang plateau is popping up and 1890 earthquake is because of that mechanism. And he preferred that the old dump fault he gave that this is uh, this south dipping. Sorry, this south dipping old dump fault uh, is the is the thermogenic fault, which has no surface on the on the on the surface. And Jela GSI Jela is uh, was uh, arguing that there there is nothing like old dump fault on the surface. It could be Brahmaputra fault and Brahmaputra river fault, which is east west trending and. Uh, so old dump fault is a very, but we are uh, all uh, talking about this old dump fault, but whether it is old dump fault or Bhumaputra uh, fault that we will see in our work. Now, seeing this, we made a, we had, uh, we had a, examined this data. This year, this was by 2000, uh, digital network has come in Northeast India by RIL Jorhat. I mean, NIST, now it is NIST. So we took this data and under Indo US project, we studied this uh, with, you know, with, a, with our group and we found that the Silong, but they are all broadband data, very well looking data, and all moment and solution done by, in, by this team. And you can see the Silong Plateau earthquakes and the Kopili fault earthquakes. The Silong Plateau earthquakes are all mostly by inverse faulting. Whereas Kopili fault earthquakes are all by mostly strike slip and normal faulting. So we have taken section across Sri Lanka plateau and along Kopili fault and across Kopili fault. Now to examine the pop-up tectonic model of the Sri Lanka plateau, this is old and uh, Bilham and England's model. We, we examined the section of the earthquakes, well located earthquakes. This is the Daugi fault. This is the Dapshitra. This is the Oldham fault. This is the Bhumaputra river fault. And all earthquakes are in this zone and down to you can say 45 kilometers or so. Then we studied the moment and solution and we found that the that these solutions are dipping, preferred solution, solutions, nodal planes are dipping to the, to the south and here that they are dipping to the north. So the nodal, the fault plane solutions, earthquake sections clearly shows that uh, there could be, you know, pop up tectonics uh, a mechanism, but uh, we could not differentiate between Dapshi thrust and Dauki fault because Dauki fault, this part is not active, rather, Dapshi thrust is more active. That we also found in our micro earthquake surveys in, in early 80s. So that boundary could be. Dauki or Dapshi, but they are one and same. They are very close and they are uh, actually extension of the Dauki port. 
But here also we could not resolve whether it's Oldham fault or Mahaputra fault because they are also very close within seven, eight kilometer. This is proposed fault by Bilham and England, and this is geologist, you know, uh, saying is that Mahaputra fault. So this is a scenario of the pop-up tectonics model. I think the pop-up tectonics mechanism works and boundary fault, well, it is, uh, it is uh, within the error limit of our observations. Now about the Copley fault, this is another intrafed earthquake in, the, in, in this zone. And this is only 2003 to 2016 data. And suddenly you can see from 2006, there are some eight, 10 earthquakes uh, in this along this Copley fault. So we re-examined this data and found that the uh, along the Copley fault means in the in this direction, uh, the earthquakes are the you know upper crustal earthquakes and lower crustal earthquakes down to something like 40, 50 kilometer. And these uh, red star shows that all well felt earthquakes might be more than five, 5.5, 5, 5.2 5, 5, 5 all. Then we took the section across this fault zone because this is the fault zone which is not a line, which is a zone of about 50 kilometer wide zone and maybe something like you know 300 kilometer long right from you know right from the 1869 earthquake to Bhutan earthquake we, we, we have talked about that which is you know transgressing the Himalaya and maybe a root cause of this calvilinear structure of the MCT and the earthquake occurred here just at this at this at the at the northern end of the Kopiti fall. So and across this fall we can see this is the section and this is the geometry of the Kofili fall and uh, and most recently we have got another earthquake here i will come to that so that also comes uh, somewhere here in at a 39 kilometer depth so this is the kopili fault is another source zone in the interpret zone of northeast india and the biggest source zone both are big source zone the sri lanka to itself and this fault already produced two large earthquakes 1869 and 1943 and and many failed earthquakes recently and even the 2016 Manipur earthquake could be its product and 2009 earthquake we, we also interpreted it could be Kopili Falls product. Now this is the sarvangelic structure we tried to understand in Sri Lanka too by by uh, fractal, bivalu and tomography and if this tomography is uh, of course matching with our earlier work with Professor Zhao and this is one of my, one of my PhD students. Uh, she did this job, Pankaj Mala Bhattacharya. And we published in uh, Journal uh, Asian Earth Sciences, possibly, uh, possibly Professor Zhao, uh, he was the editor at that time, or he was there. And uh, then he published also subsequently in the pure net participation in more, with more data and more uh, further work. So this clearly shows the Bivalu uh, I'm not going into details. Bivalu, you can do the, you know, grid. You can you can grid the whole area, and you can do the uh, mapping. That is in Z map. It is possible. It is it is uh, there. So this uh, Silang Pradu seismogenic zone, source zone, is well detected in the Bivalu as a, you know, as a say, polygonal uh, structure or whatever. And this Kopili uh, fault is a long Kopili structure. Is also well reflected by higher Bivalu. And, and also this is the pretty in the fractal dimension mapping, the Kopili fault and the Silong pad. And in the seismic tomography also the heterogeneous structure at 10, 20, and the Kopili fault is very clearly visible. And this is still existing at the depth of uh, 30 kilometer, the Kopili fault, and the uh, Silong pad is high velocity structure, but the below 30 kilometer, it is now almost coming to you know, normal model. And then further down here, the Kopili fault, uh, below Kopili fault, there is a high velocity structure. So we believe that the high velocity structure below the Kopili fault is the stress concentrator and the, it triggers the Kopili fault and we get earthquakes from, you know, from uh, shallow depth 10 to 40, 45 meter depth. So this is our, now we are coming to the most recent earthquakes. I will take, I think I will try to complete in time. Now, these are the most recent earthquakes. Manipur, 2016, Tripura, 2017, 
Mizoram 2020 and Assam 2021. Now, what are their tectonics in our in this uh, background of our knowledge? Now, this is the Manipur earthquake, the Red Star. Now, there are two thoughts or two papers came out on this Manipur earthquake. One is, uh, I think, first paper came out by this people and this is uh, 16 and this is 16. I think both came in almost the same time. So, uh, Gallot and Kundu, they said, from their GPS, you know, observations and others, you know, they have come out with a model like this, which says that this is, there is a fault, they call it CMF, CMF, that is, local name is, Chandra, uh, how do you call it? Chandra Maupu, something like that, Chandra Maupu, Mau fault. So this is, let us call it CMF. So uh, this is the CMF over here, this, this fault is CMF, this is, I think, Kaladani fault, and this is and that Chitgao fault. So there are parallel faults, and this is the eastern boundary thrust, and this is the Shagain fault. And this is the Manipur uh, 2016 earthquake, and this is a mechanism. Now, they have given this model that this, this could be due to CMF. The Chandpur Mao fault, the CMF uh, is the causative fault for this earthquake. And this is definitely dipping to the east, and this is their uh, this is their model. But now Epicing and others they published in BSSA. They studied the rupture direction, aftershocks, and uh, and the fault band solutions. And they proposed that this could be product of the Kofili fault. And I actually also prefer that possibly Kofili fault. Uh, interpretation, Kobili fault possibly the causative fault. Because if you take the, if, if you take this uh, nodal plane, this nodal plane is matching with the Kobili fault, deep also matching, and after propagation along the Kobili fault, and Kobili fault already produced so many earthquakes here, large earthquakes over here, the 1869, 1943, then most recently Assam also will come to that, then the Bhutan. So it's a long transverse structure, which is existing, I think, before collision, uh, it is a mantle leaching fault, like this the fault. So uh, this is uh, this is two observations, and uh, could be Kofili fault is the you know generator of this earthquake. Now come the 2017 Tripura earthquake. It is not a very large, the strong earthquake either. It is just 5.7 earthquake. But uh, let me first say it here. So this is Silang, but you all know this is Bengal Basin. And this is the nine old earthquake, 1950 Tipura earthquake. And this is the 2017, the bigger black star is the 2017 Tipura earthquake, 5.7 magnitude. And this one was also 5.9, I think 1950 was 5.9. And this is the Manipur earthquake black star here. Now, these small earthquakes at a depth of uh, 30 kilometer, it caused some you know, liquefaction in a in a cultivating uh, field, and uh, after field investigation, one of our student, Subhankar Das, he was M Tech student in geotechnical engineering in NIT. He took initiative to make a you know liquefaction potential map, which could be you know, used in our microgeneration mapping. So he come out with this with the geotechnical data, with the SVT data and other things. And now let us understand the generation process of this earthquake. Now this earthquake is in this map, it is here, the Tipura earthquake, and this is the Manipur earthquake, and these are the Mizoram earthquakes that I will come later. Now this Tipura earthquake, or you know, it's in the part of Bengal Basin, this Tipura earthquake in this model that Gallard and Pundu's model, uh, they have shown Manipur here, and uh, this is our Mizoram, I will come to that later. Now this is the Moni uh, Tipura earthquake, means this one means uh, rather you can say this one, and this is here, this one. So this earthquake, Manipu, uh, Tipura earthquake, is much at the interpret zone, and we call it, you know, outer IBW, indo Burma ways. This is this, they, in the model, they call it indo Burma ways. Core, this is uh, inner core, this is outer. So it is a interpret zone earthquake. 
So this is the uh, tectonics, and this is not you know, surprising. This this uh, this occurs in Bengal Basin, and uh, 5.7 is uh, is one of that. Now, if we come to the uh, Mizoram earthquake, which is really uh, you know alarming, in a sense, there are some eight earthquakes within six months, from uh, April to August. Yes, April to August, uh, some eight earthquakes. Uh, they, they are listed over here from magnitude 5 to 5.9. And this is the Aizol, uh, Mizoram capital city. And the and the nearest earthquake was in the Aizol city over here, somewhere here. This one, this is the earthquake, which was 5.3 or 5.6. I think there, there is, there is two, uh, two magnitude they are given anyway. So this is the, uh, this created a lot of panic in the Aizol city. I think a lot of, uh, lot of damage uh, were shown by uh, Dr. Sorobulwa in yesterday's lecture. So, so this is uh, this is that earthquake, and uh, all the earthquakes we we took from the uh, EHV catalog again. Oh no, this is uh, naturally not EHV catalog is ready because this is uh, from the IS catalog. EHV takes about three years to refine the depth. So those earthquakes magnitude more than five only we have taken. And these earthquakes are plotted here, all these earthquakes. And there are something like another 20 earthquakes of magnitude 4 to 4.9. And some another 30 earthquakes magnitude by more than 3 to 4. So this is a scenario uh, within six months it happened in Mizoram. So a lot of panic. And we find that the uh, Mizoram earthquakes are all within this wedge. And this is the Manipur earthquake and this is the uh, Tripura earthquake. So this is coming fitting fairly well with the given model of uh, Galat and uh, Kundu. And uh, uh, I think next we can proceed to Mizoram earthquake. Another observation that uh, this is the earthquake and this uh, rectangular zone we have taken in the Mizoram, all the earthquakes uh, only five and above. Because less than four, the data may not be complete. Because uh, you know there is a very uh, you know, controversy. Even people say five is not complete. But even, anyway, we presume five is complete. So we have taken the five magnitude data for last say, couple of years since, since 1965, and we find that the average you know number of earthquakes, maybe of the order of six uh, magnitude five and above, occurs in in that range. But in these last five years, 2015 to 2020, it has gone to 20 numbers. So this is a bit alarming, something like a swarm. A similar type of you know, swarm or similar type of higher seismicity rate we found in uh, Uttarakasi in, in, in Garol Himalaya block uh, before the uh, 1991 Uttarakasi earthquake. The average 6.6 magnitude earthquake was of the order of one or so, and suddenly it went up to three or so for a couple of years, two, three years, and then, then after some time, the Uttarakasi earthquake occurred. So, uh, Mizoram could be heading for a maybe a you know large earthquake of the order of you know seven or so because that is not uncommon in the Indo-Burma ranges. So uh, it could be another in a we cannot say we cannot say time. Uh, space and magnitude, but it is definitely alarming. Uh, a swarm type of uh, an alarm has come. Now, this is about the Assam earthquake. They call it Sonitpur earthquake. I think this is also well uh, explained by uh, Dr. Saurabh Bodua yesterday night. So I just want to tell you, this is, these are the damages and these are the building that he was telling and some, you know, spontaneous, uh, you can say, geyser or spring started. And uh, there are so, and the, the liquefaction also. And again, in that, uh, you know, that structure, uh, we have brought this earthquake, 2021 earthquake, and it is along the fault and across the fault. And if you see across the fault, uh, this is that 1897 earthquake. Means across the fault means uh, from Silong, we have plotted all the earthquakes. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, in the fault zone where you can see that. You know, fault geometry and the 2001 Sonitpur or Assam earthquake occurred over here with some fault with some aftershocks, 
and the fault pen solution also done by Santanu, Dr. Santanu Gorua of, uh, of, the, of, the, of our convener. He has found it to be a stri slip faulting mechanism and also some aftershocks he has done and which are matching with the uh, with the copily fault uh, is the positive fault for this earthquake. So I think this is a, I just want to make a you know, passing comment uh, of the recent work by Steckler that Bengal Basin is heading for a mega earthquake of magnitude 9, which I, I cannot uh, reconcile with such uh, publication or such uh, you know, information. Then I asked my uh, students, now he is a, he is a professor in, in NIT, uh, Rurki, uh, brother Raukella, and also Benit, they uh, restarted this, and this possibility possibly is not there, and uh, this is the structure, the, this is the tectonic setting given by uh, Kare Adas, uh, which is going through the Naga thrust and is joining this, you know, East Pandori thrust and coming like this. But they have shown this, this uh, 2004 rupture zone, then 1762 rupture zone like this, and they took it to the Bengal Basin uh, interior and joined it to the uh, Daugi Pole and saying uh, this Bengal Basin is heading for a mega earthquake based on the GPS data, but which is uh, possibly a bit uh, controversial or uh, subject to, you know. So, bit summary is like this, that uh, interpret earthquakes, I think we have explained this, and the interpret earthquakes in any year, we have found out the source zones, and the Bengal Basin earthquakes are also uh, the strike ship faulting and in the Bengal interpret zone. And the possibility of a mega earthquake in Bengal Basin, Stickler by others, uh, uh, is, is debatable. And the recent publication by Panda and that uh, Kundu and Galot and others, uh, Panda was his PhD student in, and uh, from GPS data, they found that, that there was some, you know, excess, uh, estimate of stress and uh, magnitude 9 earthquake is unlike. I think I will take another two minutes to complete it just to give you some glimpse. Now I again repeat uh, Dr. Mistra's point that earthquake prediction precursor is no. And identification of large earthquake source zone, yes, I have already explained you the in the interpret zone of NER part of the source zones. And seismic hazard microvision that only can help us to make a resilience, you know, society, earthquake resilience society. Yes. And this already mentioned by Dr. Mr. I will just uh, make a one point here that, well, this earthquake was found a lot of, you know, geophysical precursor, but the China Earthquake Prediction Committee did not predict it, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, so uh, whimsically. They waited for some time. Then one fine morning, they found that that a lot of you know insects and rats and snakes are all over the roads because I have heard it from a Chinese professor. And uh, then they predict uh, they said that you you vacated your houses, and the people were people came out of the houses, uh, seeing that abnormal behavior of the animals. And there was of course scientific evidence that something is wrong, and then. The earthquake occurred and lives were set, but not the properties. So earthquake prediction, if in, if this is the only earthquake successful practical prediction, uh, you know, in our in our lifetime, and it saved life, but not the properties. And uh, if you say the precursor or uh, rather forecast, I should say forecast. If you say forecast. Then again, it is it is giving some two years, three years, or five years time. Or sometimes it is giving ten years time or sixteen years time. One author has given sixteen years time. So, what you will do for even for short term, say two years or three years? Do you, can you vacate the whole city for an earthquake to come in two three years? So I think forecast and prediction is not going to help the to save the humanity. We have to live with the earthquakes. And uh, yes, Hasmolaiis cannot predict, cannot forecast also uh, precisely. 
but seismologists can identify the large earthquake source zone. Seismologists can give you the seismic hazard microgenerator micro map, and we can wisely use it for our survival. Just a glimpse. I will not go into details. This is the status of Picasa studies in Northeast India. You know, from GSI, we did a lot of work from, uh, you know, this Vibhalu uh, and POA procedures by earlier workers, Professor Guhao and Professor H.K. Gupta and Professor Khatri, Assam Gap between 1950 and 1897. So a lot of work, but then we are, then we are fascinated to do some electrical activity. We published in a good journal, in Geophysical Journal International. And that uh, two, at two sites, we took deep resistivity measurement and found that, that in all the direction there is no uh, anomaly, but at one season that in all the direction there is anomaly before a 5.8 earthquake in Kachar. So this is just to understand the behavior, physical properties before the earthquake. But we cannot say that there will be on such and such date, there will be an earthquake in Kachar. It is all postmodern for our understanding. Yes, there was a earthquake. Similarly, for the 1988 earthquake, we found some gravity changes. And also in Sikkim, there were some five managed five earthquakes, 5.8 earthquakes, 5.7 earthquakes. This also we took it from GSI. And we found that before the earthquake, there was a you know, repeat gravity measurement at a particular station that showed, you know, lower value and earthquake occur. But we don't know why, where the earthquake will occur and when it will occur and what magnitude. And this is an earthquake, you know, seismicity rate, which we, we examined in Northeast India and found there was some, you know, some uh, high rate and then the earthquake. And also the VPBA. So these are our, our, our you can say, field experiment to understand but uh, we are, I think, far away from predict prediction. Now, our first, uh, uh, you know, MPGO, the uh, Dr. Saura Borua was uh, explaining. This is the first MPGO was established in Guttu in Himalaya by Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology. And this is the, their stations. And they are monitoring a lot of parameters. So this is, I think, radon and so many things. And you can see there are a lot of peaks or spikes in the radon measurement. And the spike, which is blown here, that they have, you know, correlated with, with an earthquake here. But there are so many earthquakes and so many. I don't think we can really, we try to understand. I don't think we can really predict earthquakes. But here is a different story, this, this figure. This figure is, is a swarm hypothesis was examined by Professor Gupta, H.K. Gupta and Singh, Professor Singh of PHU. And Gupta, that time he was in NGI, right? And uh, they found that the earthquakes of different magnitude, and they took some three degree by three degree grid in Indo Burma region. And uh, with time, they plotted the number of earthquakes, I think every five years or 10 years. And they found that the swarm activity, then there is some gap. And they actually made a forecast in their 1986 publications in Technology Physics. They claim that in this grid, three, three degree by three degree grid, there is swarm and there is some quotient period, maybe for two, three years. And within three years, there could be an earthquake. They said about this, seven magnitude earthquake uh, uh, in this, in, within this area. They said the uh, magnitude, they said the depth also about 100 kilometer, means in deeper depth, and also the area. And it happened. In 19, 18, 1986, the paper came, and 1988, the earthquake occurred. And in 1989 paper, they claimed it was a successful forecast. So this is the status of prediction and forecast. Now, you know, we can give you the source zone. We can give you the, you know, microgenerator map and say in Silon, uh, we have said that this is a source zone and there is a paleoseismic evidences, you know, seismite. And on based on that, about 500 years interval time has been uh, has been talked about by, by Suki and others. So there is a seismic zone, there is a past records of great earthquakes. There is also a seismic zone here, past record of 1899, and there, this is 100 years interval time. So source zones are known and uh, it is only I think the microgenerator map can save us. And I think it's well discussed by Dr. Opi Misra. I will not go into details. In our time, we made a 
you know, combined effort by GSI, NGRI, IMD. That time it was IMD. Then NCS has come. So we made a very detailed study of the, you know, all type of landslide and the geophysical basement, gravity, everything. We did studied and 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 the side response, frequency, amplification, all study we made. And also the, you know, the people lives there. So vulnerability also studied. We gave a hazard map and this is the risk map. Which are the risk areas? You know, risk is hazard into vulnerability. So this is the risk map of the Gohardi city we produce. But the point is, what lessons we take? We are, we scientists can give you the micro generational map. Scientists can give you the source zones, but it is only the lessons of earthquakes. This is my last slide. Only the lessons of earthquake can give you uh, can save the humanity or casualties. I should say. Now you see after the Kobe earthquake. 1999. This is the Kobe earthquake, and this is the picture. You know, I, this is the, I, I have taken this picture. A picture textbook type of fast faulting earthquakes, Kobe. And in that, they have kept it as a museum. And this also in the museum, which you know the the uh, the destruction within the you know drawing room or dining room. So everything they have kept as a museum for the next generation, and they have also they are showing. The how they have recorded real recorded and simulation. They have shown how dangerous this earthquake you know, occurred and how the destruction was. It shouldn't happen. So this is Kobe. And the lesson is they have taken that before 1980, any building there is made has to be retrofitted. And after 1980, the all buildings are, you know, are insisted or rather it is it is a law that they have to make seismic design. There should be a seismic design uh, for the. So this is before the 1980 earthquake, the ERI, after Research Institute of University of Tokyo, they have retrofitted. You can see the cross bars. They have made it. Uh, I think Dr. Mr. also explained this. So you have to retrofit depending on the structure. So this is retrofitted and in front of this building, old building, there is a new building which is which is standing on the bush. So this is uh, one PhD student. She took me to show me this. I was there for some time. So, so this is the lesson Japan takes. And in the other day, Dr. Professor Jim Murray was telling that the tsunami killed the people in Japan, not the setting of the earthquake. Our engineer, he used this sentence. Our engineers did good job. Construction did not collapse to kill the earthquakes. It was tsunami which killed the earthquake. That was a so different story. And in Bhuj, what lesson we have taken? In Bhuj, so much destruction, nothing is kept. A new city has come up. And one of my good geologist friend the other day was telling that in the new Bhuj city after the earthquake, the buildings are standing on the on the fall, which we have mapped. So this is the lessons we take. So unless we take the lesson, we we cannot. So we have to live with this beautiful nature, and uh, we have to we have to learn to live. Thank you very much. I took some more time because I left, I started late. Thank you all for your kind patience. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, very insightful talk. On specificity of Northeast region of India. Now, may I invite our session chairman, Professor Dapengjo, for his final comments. How about you, Professor Dapengjo? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the excellent uh, uh, talk. I really uh, learned a lot from the lecture. I, well, <laughs> there are many important information uh, from a lecture, but uh, I'm concerned about the depth distribution of seismicity. For example, you show some uh, vertical cross sections uh, in the uh, Xilong Plateau area, showing the, the distribution of uh, intra-plate earthquakes. And uh, also, I just checked your uh, 2012 textbook physics paper, and you are the first author. Uh, in the paper, there are some cross sections showing the vertical depth distribution of seismicity. And one of the figures shows the earthquake occur even down to 75 kilometers. I wonder how reliable are the focal depths of those events? 
um, I am really could not fully uh, understood your um, question because the sound is not good here. Uh, you are talking about some depth problem. I think the uh, sex focal depth. Yeah, focal depth. Focal depth of the events. <laughs> Depth, the, of the, depth of the interpret earthquakes or subduction zone earthquakes? Uh, interpret earthquake in the Shilong, Shilong Plateau. Yes, Shilong Plateau, uh, uh, depth of the earthquakes, I think, which I have shown by our local network, that uh, the broadband network of uh, NEIST, uh, the data between 2000, um, if, if you want, I can go back to the slide, data between yes, 2003 please. to 2007, that earthquake depth is uh, up to you know maximum up to 40 kilometer. So uh, do you want me to see the show you the? I think if I yeah. can go to that uh, picture. Well, it seems, it seems yes. to me. Yeah, for example, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, you want you want to see uh, the the cross section. I think this this section this is. Uh, Fairly good section because this is based on uh, very close, something like uh, 25 uh, network, 25 broadband station was there in this. Uh, let me show you. Uh, here, there are some 60, yeah. 70 broadband stations in the whole region, but this uh -huh. area, we have something like 25. This, uh, these uh, triangles are showing the broadband station. So, this was only very good uh, events we have taken out of some thousands of events. We have taken something like 300 events for for uh, relocations and and, and okay. for uh, momentum solution. So yeah, these events are very okay. well very well located, and this is the section. And if you can see, they are up to I think uh, 40 45 kilometer in the in in the 45 kilometer 40 kilometer in the Shillong Plateau. Okay. Yes. So how and deep is Moho? How how deep, how deep is the Moho Moho this community? Oh, Moho is, is around that, uh, 42 kilometer below, below Slung Plateau, 41 to 42 kilometer. OK, so yeah. the earthquake occur almost continuously from the surface down to Moho, right? Yes, in Slung Plateau, uh, I think most intense activity between, say, in the lower class, between 20 to 40 kilometer uh, is the most intense activity. Uh -huh. You know, in most regions of the world, in most regions of the world, crustal earthquakes mainly occur in the upper crust. And there's a few events in the lower crust. Yes, so, that I have shown in the in the case of, I think I have in the show, uh, shown in the case of uh, this Kopili fault. This zone, yeah. this whole zone I have shown, the upper crust is, uh, you know, at a depth of, say, 10 to 12, 15 kilometers is quite active. Then there yes. is a gap, a thermogenic, you know, uh, gap, and then that tells some. And then the lower crust is again active. So this is uh -huh. clearly this we have clearly seen uh, in in the in this part in this interpret region in this Kopili fault so, zone. Yeah. So this region is a special. This uh, Shilong Plateau region is special. Shilong right. Plateau region is. Is special, is different from other regions of the world. Uh, you can say that because because no, yeah yes very good point because in a typical interpret region say in the Indian plate interior say Kilari if you uh, if you see that the they are the typical interpret region the earthquakes are much shallow say if I have a uh, if I have a map of India I can show you uh, I can see, if I, I have a map of India yeah, yes let me see, let me. So in the intraplate region, typical intraplate region, the earthquake depth are seven to ten kilometer. Say Kilari earthquake at a seven kilometer, Koina earthquake at a depth of six kilometer. But in the reef zone, in the Normada reef zone here in the central part of the India, the earthquakes are deeper down to 35 kilometers. That's a reef basin earthquake by inversion tectonics. And in the and in the reef zone here in the Bhuj area, Gujarat, Bhuj area, the earthquakes are up to 25, 30 kilometers. That is also a reef zone. So reef zone earthquake in the intraplate region are deep producing deeper earthquakes like in Kast reef basin in Bhuj and, and Normada reef basin in central India. But other parts of India and typical intraplate region produce earthquakes at a shallow depth. For example, 
the Koina earthquake, for example, the Latur Kilari earthquake at a depth of only seven to six kilometer, seven to ten kilometer within that depth. So in okay. typical interpret earthquakes in India, they are shallow. Uh, and you are right, the Silang Plateau earthquakes are are unusual than typical okay. interpret That's earthquakes. Right. They are oh. yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I got it. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very okay. nice. I, I forgot to mention this point. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Thank you, Professor Zhao. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Now, may, may I request our session uh, uh, co chairman, Dr. Surabura, for his uh, comments? Over to Dr. Surabura. Uh, good morning, everybody. Honorable uh, session chairman, Professor Zhao. Today's speaker, Professor Kayal and my dear fellow colleague. Indeed, as usual, it's a really a uh, proud moment for us when our mentor speaks so lucidly about the complex seismicity of uh, earthquake seismology uh, to uh, in the domain. Uh, that was really wonderful for all of us. He has explained. Uh, the northeastern seismicity, its pros and cons, and comparing all the earthquakes uh, so far that has happened in northeastern region of India. Very interestingly, the recent earthquakes also he has touched upon, and uh, I have no words to complement his work uh, because we are all are guided by his uh, work and his advice uh, to pursue our research. So it was an extra extraordinary, uh, I mean, deliberations. So on behalf of my side, a hearty congratulations and namaste to you, sir. And that is thank from you. my side. Over to Dr. Shantanu Borwa. Uh, thank you, sir. Now may I request uh, our uh, GM, oh, uh, Dr. Oh. Dr. Manus Pukon, for his comments. Thank you very much, Kaya sir, uh, for an uh, for the excellent lecture. I will always look forward to hear to you. Your mentoring has uh, immensely actually benefited us. So thank you very much, sir. I have a simple query that uh, uh, we have seen a seismic activity all along our northeastern India, but however there is a large uh, trust system, Naga Desang trust system. That is extending all along the Naga uh, Patkai Hill range. And comparatively, uh, when you see the seismicity along this area, it is uh, quite less uh, if we compare it to the Indo Roma subduction zone. So, what may be the reason uh, for less activity along this uh, trust system? And considering the dimension of this trust system, it's quite large. Is it possible that this system may generate future large earthquakes? Uh, if I understand your question, possibly you are uh, talking about uh, the maybe the section is here. Yes, possibly you are talking about further north of 26 degree latitude because north of 26 degree latitude, the subduction ceases. The subduction up to 26 degree latitude, if you see that along the you know arc, Indubarma arc, the section, the earthquakes are much intense and deep also uh, up to 26 degree latitude, but beyond 26 degree latitude means beyond this latitude, then there, there is no more subduction and this is the uh, you know, syntax is zone. So here the whole region is, uh, is uh, you can say, complex uh, tectonics between Himalayan collision and uh, Indubarma subduction of course sieges. So maybe you are talking about this, uh, this zone here, a little bit, little bit less activity here. And uh, if you say about the future earthquake zone, well, I think I think we need. I think here is uh, maybe I I can suggest. You know, now by now we have got a good data set by Wadia, by you know, your institute, and it is high time to scan the whole region by with the help of kind help of kind and generous help of Professor Chow. I think it is time to understand uh, with seismic tomography, seismic anastomic tomography, 
for the whole Northeast region. And we, I look forward uh, you know, Indo-Japan collaboration uh, between uh, NIST and NCS, uh, where OP is there, that they take up uh, this Northeast region and OP Mr. can, he is now the boss of data data center <laughs> for the whole for the whole country, and he is direct student of Professor Zhao. <laughs> I think it will work so nice to yes, have sir. a very detailed sarvajanic picture of the sarvajanic structure. What we could do, we could do only for Sri Lanka to many bit piecemeal, Sri Lanka to and the Kopili for zone, but. I think time has come, as you say, this is a good area, syntax is zone area, uh, where we can really scan. There, a lot of work has been done by Dr. Soro Bodua and uh, Professor Taponia in their field visits. They have done excellent work on geological investigations, but now I think Professor Zhao may help us to, to support us with the, you know, Im imaging of the whole structure in this complicated stuff in a zone. Thank you so much for the nice question. Thank you, sir. But, but, uh, but sir, I was just referring to the Nagat Disan Trust System. That is uh, west of uh, the subduction zone. Uh, just uh, uh, that is called the Belt of Chupen. Uh, you may be know, you definitely know about the Belt of Chupen. Uh, if we observe the Belt of Chupen, the activity is very less as compared to the, uh, yes. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I, yes, I, yes. Uh, I, I, Yes, western, I, I, I western think, side a little bit western. Uh, I western? think I have explained yeah, yeah. you yeah, the, yeah. that the beyond 26 degree latitude, the subduction process is no more there. It is it sieges. So this zone, this uh, if you mean this zone, if I, if you can see my arrow, yeah. this zone and this is 26 degree latitude. So to the north of 26 degree latitude, this zone is not a subduction zone. You can see here, beyond 26 degree latitude, no more subduction process is there or deeper earthquakes are there. So it is a subduction mechanism is not generating earthquakes there. So whatever earthquakes are coming, it is possibly due to only Himalayan collision zone. So that is why it could be less. But if you say this one, this valley in low sensitivity, I think this was well explained in our model that this could be a, you know, Jack, from the Jackson model that the sediments takes up the stress by creeping. And this Assam gap was identified first by Professor Khatri, low activity, this, I mean, the valley part, the sediment part. And we also explained that it could be due to, you know, sediment thickness or sediment, you know, creeping uh, mechanism. So this part is, uh, is uh, controversial again, whether gap, or creeping mechanism, but in this part, I think there are no more subduction beyond 26 degree latitude. Okay, sir. You Thank understand you. my point? Yes, so sir. here the earthquakes in this part is due to Himalayan collision zone, so that is uh, less than you know typical subduction zone earthquakes in uh, you know, south of 26 degree latitude. This part is intense, but above it not intense, your, your observation is very good. Above it, not intense because subduction is no more there beyond 20 degree latitude. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have come to the end of the session. Uh, now may I request uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Azadika to, for the vote of thanks, please. Ms. Onesa Dr. Azadika. Thank you, sir. Namaskar and good morning from India. It is a great privilege for me to propose a vote of thanks to all who have helped in making this technical session a resounding success. On behalf of the CSI NAPT family and the entire organizing committee of IVWGST 2021, I convey our gratitude and sincere thanks to Professor J.R. Kyle, sir, for accepting our invitation and consenting to deliver the lecture today on the topic recent large and felt earthquakes in northeast india seismotectonics and precursor appraisal 
Professor Kayal's erudite presentation on seismotectonics and recent seismicity in the Northeast India is highly educative and also bears and warning to prepare ourselves better to face impending large earthquakes in the near future. Once again, thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your experiences, insights, and recent updates on the recurring earthquakes in the northeastern part of India. And also, thank you for your unflagging support towards this event. I also express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Dr. G. Nara Hari Shastri, Honorable Director of CSIR NIST Jorhat, for providing moral support and ubiquitous help in conducting IVW GST 2021. I would like to extend my heartiest thanks to our international advisor of this workshop, Professor uh, Andrew J. Michael from USGS for his valuable guidance and support. I take this opportunity to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to Professor Dapling Zhao, eminent scientist from Tohoku University, Japan, for his esteemed presence amongst us and for kindly obliging to be the chairperson for today's session. Thank you, Professor Zhao for your generous support and constant encouragement throughout this workshop. I also express my gratitude to our co-chairperson of today's session, Dr. Saurabh Borwa, Chief Scientist of CSIR NIST, for providing immense guidance and for being constantly connected with this program. I also extend a deep sense of appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Shantanu Borwa, the convener of this workshop, for conceptualizing such a splendid idea to organize this virtual workshop and thus facilitate the direct access of the geosciences community with the experts and pioneers in seismology and tectonics from across the globe. For finally, I solicit your continued support during the course of this workshop and look forward to see you all for the next session of the day at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. The speaker for the session will be Kure Zalohar from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and the topic of his lecture will be the Omega Theory and the Time-Dependent Earthquake Forecasting. With this, I conclude this session. Once again, thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I'll see you.